Right now at 11, we continue our breaking news coverage. Two U.S. Park Police officers indicted in the shooting death of Bijan Gezar. Yeah, next month marks three years since Gezar was killed after leaving the scene of a fender bender where he was actually the victim. Seven is on your side now with team coverage. Annalisa Gale with the charges and Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Tim Barber with the Gezar's families fight for answers. But let's start with Annalisa tonight and the prosecutor's very big announcement today. They're very happy. They're very emotional. Bijan Gaysar's family had one of their wishes granted on Thursday as Commonwealth's attorney Steve Descano announced that two park police officers have now been indicted by a grand jury following his death. Each officer was indicted separately for one count of manslaughter and one count of reckless discharge of a firearm. Gaysar was shot and killed by the park police officers on the George Washington Parkway in 2017. The local indictment comes after federal prosecutors decided not to charge the officers. The federal law is different from state law. And our conclusion was that this was a case that should be charged. In the, the charges also come after months of protests over the use of alleged excessive force by officers in various parts of the country. Do you feel like there's more pressure when it comes to social justice? As a general matter, uh, social justice and, and criminal justice reform have become very big topics in our community. It's something that I know the residents of Fairfax County and the residents of Virginia have um, made of prime importance. I can't say and wouldn't imagine that that would have uh, any indicate uh, any effect on what happened in the grand jury. The officers could face up to 15 years behind bars. In Fairfax County, Annalisa Gale, ABC 7 News. And when you think of it, it was this dash cam video right here that we got and that we all saw of the pursuit and the deadly encounter that was only made available because a Fairfax County police officer followed Park Police when that pursuit ended up in the county. But a question remains tonight. Can federal officers really be charged at the local level when the Department of Justice didn't pursue this case? Officers Lucas Vineyard and Alejandro Amia, they are expected to turn themselves in eventually. But tonight, Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Tim Barber continues our team coverage with the Gazar's family three-year fight for answers. November 17, 2017, U.S. Park Police officers Alejandro Amaya and Lucas Vineyard fired nine shots at Bijan Gaysar and killed the unarmed 25-year-old. Gaysar had just been the victim of a fender bender on the George Washington Parkway, but he kept driving away from the officers. An autopsy showed marijuana in Gaysar's system. When he did stop, an officer approached his car gun drawn, then banged on the door and kicked it while Gaysar drove away. The third time he starts driving away, officers open fire. Every anniversary, ABC7 has spoken to the family. Only way I can think is that he's here and he, I feel him, I see him. The Gaysars filed a multi-million dollar civil lawsuit, demanded federal prosecutors charge the officers, and push for legislation requiring uniformed federal officers to have body and dash cameras. He was such a compassionate, loving, caring son. We wake up every morning hoping that it was a nightmare. Last year, the Department of Justice declined to prosecute the officers, writing, evidence that an officer acted out of fear, mistake, panic, misperception, negligence, or even poor judgment cannot establish the high level of intent required by the courts. In September, for the first time, court records revealed the officers claimed they had feared for their lives and gave chance after chance to Gaysar before firing. They also argued they would have put more people in danger had Gaysar kept driving. Here at U.S. Park Police Headquarters, it took the Gaysar family more than a year to get the names of those officers. Now those names are on an indictment. Reporting in Northwest Washington, Tim Barber, ABC 7 News. And in a statement reacting to what happened today, the Gazar family thanked prosecutors and advocates who joined their fight. Now, you can see Tim's and Seven on Your Side's breaking news coverage over the past three years of this story. We put it all online for you at our website, WJLA.com. And we have updates each step of the way, and we're going to continue to provide breaking news alerts as this truly unique legal process has just gotten started. To the election now, where after yesterday's website crash, a judge has extended Virginia's voter registration deadline to 11.59 p.m. tomorrow. And take a look at this. ABC7 cameras at locations throughout Fairfax County finding long lines as 13 new voting centers open for the first time. ABC7 Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Tim Barber is at the McLean Early Voting Site. And Tim, the site closes in about an hour, but... 
by the judge of that crowd size behind you, it looks like folks are still going to be lined up well past that. The line has been long all day. In fact, we were told to get out here long before they opened up at one o'clock so we could find a good parking spot out here, but we still had to park down the street. I want the right guy to win, so I just have been really uh, grateful that there is the possibility of a new president. Beverly Groom was the first voter in line at the McLean Governmental Center, one of 13 early voting locations that just opened in Fairfax County. This is a typical location. What's new is the, the expression of interest. For weeks, the only place Fairfax County residents could vote in person was at the government center, where the pandemic created record-breaking lines. So seven on your side asked election officials why the additional sites were not opened earlier. It's a very complex situation, arranging for staffing and access to the facilities. County officials tell us they've had nearly 6,300 new online voter registrations since Saturday alone. But last night, construction crews in Chester, Virginia, accidentally cut a cable that shut down the Commonwealth's election website the night of the voting registration deadline. My team and I went to work yesterday afternoon, literally worked around the evening and into the early morning hours. This morning, a judge granted an extension until tomorrow at midnight. Was there a playbook for this? What exactly did you argue in court? In this election season, there have been a lot of curveballs where there isn't a playbook really. In court, we explained the circumstances, and I think most people would recognize that it wasn't Virginians, Virginia voters' fault that the online portal went down, and it was important to get that time back. And on Saturday, a 14th location opens up at Great Falls Library. Reporting live in Fairfax County, Tim Barber, ABC 7 News. Tim, thanks. Seven's on your side with the key dates you need to know. The first is that new voter registration deadline in Virginia, as we mentioned, 11.59 p.m. tomorrow is that new deadline. Early voting starts in Maryland, October 26. And remember, you can register and vote at the same time during early voting. In D.C., early voting starts October 27th. The ABC 7 team has compiled all the key information on early voting, whether by mail or in person. Just go to WJLA.com slash vote. After intense debate about reopening, some schools will open their doors next week, welcoming students for the first time since the pandemic began. Fox 45's Katie Kairos has details on what to expect. Timelines are still up in the air and hotly debated in several districts. Harford and Carroll counties are moving forward, but in other districts, Virtual learning may be here to stay for the semester. In the coming weeks, some schools will officially reopen their doors. Harford and Carroll counties both bringing younger students back into the classroom starting Monday. Anne Arundel County working towards a November 16 date approved by the school board, but that may be in jeopardy. I'm not comfortable going back right now with the plan that they have in place. Teacher Nicole Young says in her survey of about 10% of fellow teachers, nearly half said they'll apply for accommodations to continue teaching virtually, which could lead to a teacher shortage. The district has pushed the deadline for families and teachers to say whether they want to return to Monday. I am not safe, my students are not safe, my coworkers are not safe. Dr. Diane Jass Kettlehut, an online learning expert, says the longer students go without in-person learning, the further behind they'll be. There has been time lost that is going to be hard to catch up as this thing continues on and on. She says the district's virtual learning models aren't sufficient as substitutes for in-person, no matter how hard teachers work. They did not have the training time they needed. What we have now is not online teaching where people are prepared to do something. What we have instead is what's called the emergency remote teaching where we suddenly drop the teachers, we drop the kids and the parents and the siblings and the house dynamics into this new situation that nobody was prepared for. An Anne Arundel County Public School spokesperson tells us the deadline for teachers to say whether they'll return or not is now 5 p.m. on Monday and they can share details of any possible teacher shortage after that. So developing now a fight to reopen classrooms in one of the region's biggest school districts. Open schools! Open schools! 
That parking lot protest held by families who want Loudoun County to accelerate plans to reopen schools. That's even as some 7,000 eligible students are set to begin in-person instruction just two weeks from today. Another marathon school board meeting continues right now. It started this afternoon. Seven on your side's Heather Graff with one proposal to bring more kids back that was just shot down moments ago. Heather, tell us more. Well, Michelle, that proposal would have cleared the way for about 30,000 students in grades 3rd through 12th to begin the hybrid learning model starting December the 1st. But the motion failed with a 5 to 4 vote, prompting different reactions depending on who you ask. It's not the first protest organized by Loudoun County families who were frustrated with virtual learning. Oh! But they're back because they feel the school board isn't listening. I miss going to school, having lunch with my friends. I miss having that social inter interaction that kids need to have instead of just sitting in front of a computer. Among the crowd on Tuesday afternoon, we met high school freshman Aiden Poe and his mom Aaron, who feel Loudoun County Public Schools should be implementing the hybrid learning model much more quickly. So yes, they're bringing kids back, but at what rate? It's not effective enough because these kids are crashing. As for the kids who have been approved for in-person instruction, September 8th, it began with 900 students at the Monroe Advanced Technical Academy. Then, starting today, 800 special education students return to the classroom two days a week. And on October 27th, LCPS says English language learners, pre-K students, and about 7,000 kids in kindergarten, first and second grades will do the same. They're saying they're moving forward, but really that is such a small percentage of students. Meanwhile, the teachers union says the school district needs to slow down. It just seems like not everything is well thought out, and we're really concerned about everyone staying safe. And as the school board hears from people on both sides of the debate. Students are failing. We are suffering. A reminder inside this socially distanced meeting room that the coronavirus pandemic isn't over. Leave your mask covering your nose and your mouth while you're speaking to the board. Thank you. So after about seven hours of back and forth conversation, several motions considered, but tonight no major changes were approved for the county's return to school plan. Of course, we'll keep you updated. For now, we're live tonight in Ashburn. Heather Graff, ABC 7 News. Heather, thanks for that. And the Virginia Department of Health allows you to track the coronavirus in every jurisdiction and how it relates to the return to school based on CDC guidance. And they've set up what you see here behind me. This is a color-coded chart. You can see the green means lowest risk, and you go all the way down to red, which is the highest risk. So you, depending on the color of what's safe to go back to school, you would refer to this kind of chart. Now, there are two core indicators, though, to pay attention to, starting with new cases. That would you would find in the orange level over here. You'd see, and that would be at a higher risk when you see that. The second highest. Now, below 50 would be moderate and would be in the yellow category. But when it comes to positivity rate, lighter green, lower risk, and just barely. But here's what's concerning. New cases are rising at a rate that puts Loudoun at the highest risk. That would be that red at the very bottom that I was talking about right there. That's the highest risk for spread in schools, and that's based on the chart. So concerning for parents and students.